Awesome. Okay, so I just did the mute game. You, you all heard the announcement about this event being recorded. So if you would not like to appear on camera, please just turn your video off uh, for the remainder of the session. Uh, welcome. welcome to Artivism, the power of art for social transformation. Our second semester, this is the second installment of our second semester doing this initiative. And we have plenty more, so please go to the website. You could just Google Artivism and Adelphi, and the website will come up with all the events. You can see some of our past events, which were really uh, transformative and powerful. Also, if we have any students online right now, if you're interested in serving as a student ambassador, please contact me, Professor Agilorakis, or Carolina Cambranera. And we will help to set you up with any of those events. Um, right now, Professor Agilorakis will introduce our student ambassador of the day. Welcome, Professor Agilorakis. Oh, RG, you're muted too. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us again today for um, Artivism, the power of art for social transformation. We are into season two, fall 2021. Um, today we have Dr. Alexander Sorokin. We have a very busy fall schedule and um, pretty much filled up for the spring and hopefully we'll be filling up the fall of 2022. So today's student ambassador is Maria Jimieros, I have known Maria since her freshman year. She is now a senior. Um, she is a biology major. While preparing for graduation in uh, for this fall 2021, um, she is applying or has applied by now to medical school. Um, she was in search of a unique and stimulating experience. Um, therefore, here she is today in Artivism. Um, so Maria, let's see, what else can I say about you? Uh, what she says is even though she won't be able to see, oh, just let me take a step back, I'm sorry. Maria and Rowan are both um, trying to establish an artivism club, club at Adelphi University. Um, so even though Maria will not be at Adelphi to see the real fruit that's grown from this initiative, she will leave knowing that she was part of it, she inspired it, and a little bit of her will live on. Um, so even though, I, I quote, I won't be able to see the full potential the Artivism organization will reach during my time at Adelphi, the inst instinctual drive to advocate for inclusion will remain with me in my next steps as a medical student. So I wanna wish Maria with all of my heart because I've known her since she was a baby freshman. I wish you the best of luck and we will always be here to support you. So Maria, it's now you introducing um, Dr. Sorokin. Thank you, Professor. Okay, hi everyone. It's so nice to be here with you all today. Um, as Professor Angularaki said, my name is Maria Chmarios. I am a senior biology major. So this is my last semester at Adelphi. I've just finished applying to medical school for the upcoming fall. I'm so thankful for all the amazing teachers, faculty, and friends that I've met over the years at Adelphi. In my time here, I've participated in chemistry research with Dr. Sockman. We're working with a protus, trichomonas vaginalis, and working to find a compound which will successfully inhibit the growth of the maternal resistant strains of it. In addition to my research, I'm an assistant for two biology, teaching assistant for two biology courses. Outside of school, I've completed my phlebotomy certification. I tutor, um, I work, and I do my fair share of shadowing in the medical field. Something I really treasure is the Artivism Club, which has brought me to you today. I'm working really hard with my co-founder, Rowan, Professor Angularakis, Dr. Lake, and Carolina to create a really special club. Our club's mission is to serve as a platform for the students at Adelphi to advocate for social injustice through art. We will be working closely with the CJ, the CJ Club and are looking forward to their advice on how our club can serve properly. Something that I think about a lot and I plan to advocate for is discrimination in healthcare. In particular, I want to fight to close the gap in knowledge that exists in women's health. Coming from a family with a lot of women, it's something that really resonates with me. With that being said, I'm so excited to introduce our presenter for today. So I would like to present Dr. Alexander Sorokin. He holds a PhD in neurobiology and has published in the fields of human visual and auditory perception. 
physio physiology of developmental disorders, and psychodiagnostics of autism. In addition to his research affiliations with Moscow State University of Psychology and Education, the Haskins Laboratories in New Haven, he is, an act, he is active in the area of museum accessibility. He is serving as the inclusion and diversity consultant at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts in Moscow. His recent publication, Three Guided Tours, addresses provisions for people with autism, intellectual disability, and dementia in an art museum. So with that being said, welcome Dr. Sorokin. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Maria. I was also a biology major, and um, you never know where you end up, uh, but it's a good start. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I was in almost all uh, Artivision uh, sessions last uh, academic year, and I enjoyed every one of them. And um, I'm really impressed of what you're doing in making our world a better place through art and through activism and through accept, acceptance and uh, through all your projects. But what we're going to talk about today is um, there are sometimes barriers that you have to go over before you become acceptable. And uh, I will be talking about museum, accept, uh, museum inclusion, um, which is a very hot topic because a couple of years ago, museums understood that they are not uh, attracting some parts of population, including people with different developmental disabilities. And um, well, no matter how good my project is, if someone is not able to perceive it and understand what I'm talking about or perceive it on a different level, um, then I have to work for it. And so uh, this is what would, we were doing at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts. Before I start a disclaimer, I will be talking about autism. I will be talking about other developmental disorders. Nothing I will be saying today uh, can be translated into individual recommendation. So if you think that you have autism yourself or you have someone in the family, please don't uh, think about what you're going to hear as something that you can use in your own life. If you think that there's some need for professional help, get professional help. So it's very important because um, I will be talking about a project that we um, had at a museum, so which is not a place to get professional help for any developmental disorder or for any uh, disability. And before I start, I just wanted to show a very short video about of the museum so you know um, what where uh, it all took place. So this is the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts that is a little bit more than 100 years old. And it st started as a study museum, a museum where students would come and see plastic casts and original works of art, paintings and sculpture to uh, study it, but it grew very quickly and became one of the major cultural institutions in the world. And as any art museum, uh, it is an overwhelming place. And it overwhelms on very many levels. And it overwhelms on uh, 
overwhelms our sensory system. So if we talk about the five major sensory input ways, which are vision, hearing, smell, test, and touch, well, perhaps with the uh, um, exception of uh, taste, like in the museum, there's just too much. It's too loud because of echoing in larger rooms. Um, objects are too large, so you are overwhelmed visually. Uh, you are not allowed to touch certain things. And if you touch things you are allowed to touch, they may um, be an, an unusual experience to you, and so on and so forth. And there is a part of population and uh, these are not necessarily people who have some formal diagnosis who have lower threshold of sensory um, systems. And um, they always, uh, they sometimes suffer under what we call a sensory overload. And one of these groups are people with autism spectrum uh, disorders. And uh, it has been um, shown several times, I'll show in the foreground a video that was produced by the British uh, National Autistic Society, that things that are loud seem louder for people uh, with autism. Things uh, that are bright, they seem brighter for people with autism. There are several theories why this is, and I'm not going to go into this, although this is exactly the uh, area of my scientific investigation. But what we know is that people with autism report being overwhelmed by sensory stimuli. And in um, a context of a, an art museum, it all is sometimes um, manifests so strongly that uh, people with autism and their families stop coming into the museum. So there were several um, research studies that showed that um, people with autism and uh, their families don't feel welcome uh, in an art museum. And there's a saying that uh, goes like mother, of a child with autism always knows where the exit is because um, the sensory overload very often manifests in unwanted behavior that is not welcome. And so the parents don't have any other choice just to take uh, the child out of uh, the space and never come again. And so in this video, we see it in a shopping mall, but the experience in a museum can be very similar. So um, I'm using the word a child with autism or an individual with autism, not because I want to offend um, anyone. So there's a certain dynamics there in um, words we're using for that. We used to, well, not we, but people used to use the word autis, which is dying out. So most people don't want to be addressed this way. Um, there is a strong movement now for this for the community of people with autism to be called autistic people. Uh, I'm using the word child with autism or individual with autism because of, like in our scientific world, it's the most neutral thing. It's a very common um, condition. One in 55 children, um, who are born today will have a diagnosis of autism in eight years. And um, it's not a huge number, the, uh, there's a tendency of it to grow. In the beginning of the 70s, uh, 1970s, there were um, just one or two in every 10,000 uh, children. And it grew exponentially. We don't really know why this is happening, but um, it is something we really have to consider now if we want to make our institutions, including art museums, uh, acceptable uh, and uh, inclusive. I always start my presentations with uh, the photo of Leo Connor, who was the first one who described um, autism as a standalone condition in 1943, and of Hans Asperger, who described a similar condition in 1944. Um, we use you may have heard about the asperger syndrome but uh, it is going away slowly it's no longer in your uh, classification there are a couple of reasons for that but before leo connor and before hans asperger in the 40s there was Gruny Efimovna Sukhareva in 1925 who described a condition that was very very similar to autism but she didn't call it autism. She called it the psychotic uh, schizoid uh, psychopathy, which uh, that's why we don't call 
autism uh, named after her, but uh, for me as someone who was trained in Russia and worked in Russia for very many years, uh, it's very important to uh, point this out. One of the tendencies is that these different conditions like autism or Asperger's syndrome and others are now combined into one uh, umbrella condition that's called autism spectrum disorder. And there's no scientific foundation for that. The, this is a humanistic uh, movement that was brought into life by Lorna Wing in, late 70s, uh, in the late 70s, who was not only a researcher and clinical professional, but who also was a mother of a child with autism. And she said, it's inhuman to divide people who have a lot of autism or who have not very much autism. So we have to put it into one uh, uh, box and she wanted to call it uh, autism continuum. It didn't work. We call it autism spectrum now. We don't know much about autism spectrum uh, disorders, but what we do know is we know that they very, that people with autism very often have this uh, lower threshold of uh, sensory systems. If we are thinking about smell, about touch, about uh, hearing, about uh, taste and about something else, what have I forgotten? The fifth one, or the five major senses. We very often don't understand that the risks are about, uh, around us. And uh, it is one of the first uh, meetings of the year. And I thought it would be a good idea for us to get to know each other a little better. So we will now go into breakout rooms for five to seven minutes. And I wanted you to ask each other, like, what's your name is and one, why you're joining these uh, meetings, but also to talk about one of the rooms uh, that you know very well. It can be the room you're sitting in right now, or well, if you're working on a project, it can be the room where your project takes place. If you work in a museum, it could be a gallery in the museum you like most. And please think about it, about the risks you see there in terms of these five um, um, senses. So what is too loud? What is too smelly? What is too uh, large? What is, what is uh, too bright in the room you are in? So think about the five senses and try to figure out what could be a risk. Or maybe it is something that you like about this room or you like about this uh, space, but that may be uh, dangerous for people who suffer from sensory overload every now and then. And please don't overthink it. Uh, there are no right or wrong ways to uh, uh, discover and to describe these sensory uh, risks. Are we all back? Just two more people, but the majority are back. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe they went away from the computer. Um, so when they will be back. Uh, okay. Does anyone want to share like one or two examples of uh, sensory stimuli um, that you discussed in your small groups? Irene. I know your name, so <laughs> Colin. Yeah. Hey, Alexander. Hi, Irene. Long time, let's see. <laughs> um, we were very silent. No one unmuted himself in our room. <laughs> so um, we talk, we chatted about noise, which is something that I now annoys my son uh, when we are in uh, some environments and. Um, I remember somebody I knew from Switzerland who used to put like these noise canceling headphones that you, back then it was the ones you would get like on a work site, you know, the really giant ones. And she used to put them on her baby because she noticed that her baby was reacting really badly in New York of all the noise, uh, which we all know are terrible. And uh, we were wondering what would be good practices in a museum environment uh, about this. And we uh, were saying maybe uh, other than bringing your own gear or borrowing gear that might not be very hygienic, that maybe there could be signs raising awareness on the noise levels in some spaces. And in this way, maybe also letting people know that they could like 
try to lower their own um, you know voice etc yeah and I think also that we could imagine that there's like an alternative guide for good practices in a museum mm -hmm. like uh, please be mindful that you know if we're in a group for example and you know things like this well people have definitely worked on this and a couple of years you you have a great example with noise cancelling headphones a couple of years ago in a talk like that i would uh, perhaps would have said uh, it is a nice thing to have a sensory bag so some museums and some organizations still have them like in this bag there are things who, that can channel your attention to something else and sometimes they have noise cancelling headphones but you also raised the question with hygiene and uh you don't want a child or an adult with autism to try these noise cancelling headphones for the first time in the museum yeah so you may have them in the museum for the chat for for a situation that they forgot theirs or they broke and then will suddenly you like a magician uh say oh look i have something here that may help but please be very very careful in uh offering this help because it depends on the family, it depends on the tradition, it depends on the child. So you, you can never know. And like when you're offering that sort of help, you may decide to talk not directly to the individual with autism, but with, with the person who accompanies them. Um, like it's, there's no one size fit all. Yeah, uh, and uh, yes, there are some guidelines, and I will be talking about some of them uh, later in the talk. We have someone else, just an example of a sensory uh, stimulus, a sensory annoying uh, thing you discussed in your small groups. Um, so yeah, in my group, we discussed um, the sensory thing, like this no, no smelling. And we're like, oh, our rooms are like filled with different fragrance that might come off strong to other people. And we also mentioned about the noise because one of my group members were outside and we could have heard the noise and the light and the sunshine that she was feeling outside. So yeah, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, noise and smell, it's something that we can adjust to very quickly. We know that like where if we're wearing perfume we know that like in a couple of minutes we don't notice it ourselves but other people may and um, um we have to be mindful about that and there's a good test for that many people know what sensory over overload feel likes it feels like is when we're getting ill like the first minutes the first hours of it when we don't know yet that we already have fever so everything is fantastically annoying do you know this feeling like uh, things in the next room are too loud and i don't want this i don't want that it just become cranky and so this is perhaps something that we can uh we can test our uh, sensory input against if we uh have to i'll go back to the I'll, thank you for sharing and uh i joined a couple of uh conversations of colleagues and you really had a nice insight so what did we do in the museum when we wanted to test uh sensory overload well first of all we had some cool technology but you don't really need it uh, so one of them was this is my favorite is the temperature map so uh during the week it is being tested how many people are in which room of the museum and of course the more people you have in one room the more sensory input you have there and so we have it for like both um uh, for both uh, floors of the museum and so when we were working on guidelines, when we were working on recommendations, we wanted to channel people who may have uh, problems with uh, their sensory system into rooms where there would be um, less people than uh, usually. Uh, then we were looking at the light and we were looking at uh, things that you are allowed to touch and not allowed to touch. For example, this room, First seems to be a very nice one in terms of sensory overload because you have dimmed light here and you have these massive uh, boxes with artwork. And by the way, this is the gold from uh, Troy um, 
one of the highlights of the museum. But if you look into the next gallery, you see that the difference between lighting in one and the other room is very strong. And so this may be a sensory uh, overload um, source itself. And in this next room, actually you don't see the, a lot of light. It's like the difference with the darker room that works this way, but we have a lot of freestanding sculptures there that are just a physical risk. So if a child runs against them, then there will be no way to save them. Um, people we asked uh, refer to this red color of uh, the walls as impossible, that it was very annoying. Um, in the next gallery, we have the same red that was never reported. So it's not only like the color itself, it's the combination of colors, like the same red color with gold, uh, golden frames uh, is a sensory risk, like the same red color with white and bronze um, sculpture against it is no uh, sensory risk. We can work with some of them, we can't work with other uh, sensory risks. So for example, if we take old, master, uh, old master's paintings, like there is blinking blinks of light, you can't do anything with it. So they, they will always be there. But if you come there with a group of children with autism, for example, and you know about it, you can find a position for this group so that they will not be affected by this risk too much. Or there are some uh, lighting um, um, equipment that can be a sensory risk uh, on its own. So whom did we ask? We decided that what we feel is not enough. So we uh, invited people from these diverse groups like parent associations and funds and research centers and universities and clinical centers and other museums. And we had people with autism. We had parents of children with autism. ASD is uh, abbreviation for what is a spectrum disorder. And uh, so on and so on and so on. And we had also people who work in the museum in different um, in different departments, and we asked them about sensory risks. And uh, most sensory risks are listed here, but in your um, environment where you work, it may be a different list. So what do you do with them after you've, uh, after you've, dis uh, after you've found all these uh, risks? Most museums, they organize them into so-called sensory maps. And these are several old examples. So none of the, these examples uh, is still used by these museums anymore, and I'll tell you why. Uh, and I don't want to criticize these museums at all. So these, these are my favorite museums, but uh, very often the uh, maps that they're providing, they're too difficult to navigate. So if you come to the museum with a child with autism or with uh, an individual with autism, if you know that there is a risk of sensory overload and you get a map like this, it would take you like a couple of minutes to figure out what's going on there. Um, or you have a map where a room that is less risky in terms of sensory overload is someone in the back of the museum. So here's the entrance. It means like I have to get into the museum and then I have to find stairs and then to get somehow to a space with low subdued light. But how do I get there? Like if I have to get go through a lot of rooms that have a lot of uh, sensory risks. And uh, we collected these examples from all over the world. We spoke with experts and uh, I don't think it was published somewhere. It's private communication with someone who uh, consulted a large museum group uh, in the United States who said that they don't lay out these maps anymore because no one is using them. So they just uh, of no use, but we wanted a map and we already had a grant for a map. So we wanted to do something. So we produced a so-called sensory safety map. So we didn't want to, uh, focus on sensory risks. We wanted to focus on rooms that are less risky in terms of uh, sensory safety. And this is what our sensory safety map looks for, or looks uh, like. So this is the entrance into the museum. You go up the 
upstairs and you get into one, two, three galleries with minimal risks of sensory overload. So these are the three galleries. We recommend families that know that there, there's a risk of sensory overload to start uh, visiting a museum from. So it's, it's not that we say, don't go there, go there. It's, it's just a recommendation. And it's a very simple, a very straightforward thing. So we don't have to work much on it. You can look it up online or you can get it, in, it uh, as a paper map or when you enter the museum. And it takes you like a couple of se seconds to understand what is going on there. There's, there are just three galleries that have just few uh, sensory risks. They're very close to the entrance, so you can go away if you want. All of them have benches, so you can sit down. And they don't have any physical risk there. There are no stairs, there are no um, sculptures that can uh, be pushed over, and so on and so forth. So once you've navigated these spaces, you can venture into other spaces, which we call galleries with moderate risks of sensory overload. So they had one or two risks identified there, but they were not that bad. So once you uh, feel confident enough, you can go in there. And in terms of sensory risks, yes, we do mark them, but you have to look for it. Uh, they're on the website. So like if you're interested, if you know exactly what can be the source of this un unwanted behavior because of the sensory overload, you can go and you can find it online. And so this is this was our way to uh, deal with uh, sensory overload in uh, our museum, and it turned out to be a successful one because uh, tour guides who work in the museum, they um, very often plan their visits if they know that there is a school group coming with uh, children with autism, they would start with these three galleries, uh, where they don't have to deal with a lot of uh, different uh, behavioral problems. They are very often not qualified to deal with. And um, this is just one part of our work. Uh, we also produce other materials for uh, people with autism, like um, social narratives, for example, or we train tour guides, but this sensory, um, Safety is in the center of our uh, inclusion endeavors for, uh, for people with um, autism. Um, two other groups we were working with are people with dementia and people with intellectual disability. And I'm happy uh, to tell you that a book was published just last week uh, with um, guidelines for tour guides who prepare tours for people of um, people with dementia, people with autism, people with intellectual disability. You see the book is in Russian. We're now working on English and Spanish translation. If you want to volunteer and help us with editing, uh, please be in touch, uh, because um, this is what we uh, are really very proud about, not just me, but the whole inclusion um, department of the Pushkin Museum. And it has three dots on uh, its cover, not because we only we find it nice in terms of a design decision, but also there was a teaser for uh, the Pushkin Museum a couple of years ago with two dots, and the two dots were, uh, um, symbol for two eyes, and you know that people with autism sometimes uh, have problems with maintaining eye contact, but uh, when I teach classes in um, biology and psychology of autism, I, uh, I teach uh, professionals that it's not about the quality, the quantity of eye contact, but it's about eye contact that's used to uh, start maintaining and social interaction. I and my social interaction with you with this teaser and I hope you enjoy it as much as we did a couple of years ago when it went.
yeah, so thank you very much. Um, this is my email address. This is the uh, web address of uh, the Pushkin Museum and the hashtag we're using for um, our inclusion projects. Thank you very much. And um, I enjoyed being here with you. So thank you so much for being with us, for being our artivist today, Dr. Sorokin. Um, next Monday, September 27th at 4.30 p.m., we, have, we will have Miss Alyssa Wright present Theater as a Tool for Social Change Fundraising. So before we open up the floor to questions for our presenter, we ask that you participate in a short poll that will be up on your screen right now. For more information on us and all of the series past and upcoming events, please go to our website. You can follow our Instagram. Um, you can check out our YouTube channel or you can Google us and you can also email us. I'm gonna post everything in the chat so that you have access to it. So I would now like to ask if there are any questions for our artivist. You can use the raise hand function. You can unmute yourself and you can ask your question in the Zoom chat, whatever you prefer. I actually have a question for you. Maybe that'll inspire other questions. What inspired you to get started on this? Did you have someone in your family that inspired you or was this just like a strictly, like what inspired you to do this? Uh, it was, it all clicked together because um, as I said, I'm a biologist by training, but I, I worked clinically for many years as a, a neurophysiologist in child psychiatry. Uh, with um, uh, the focus on ADHD and then autism or because autism is growing. So everyone uh, is now a specialist uh, on autism. And uh, I'm a museum aficionado. I was going to museums religiously for my whole life. And the Pushkin Museum is, is the museum I'm calibrated uh, against. You know, that museum you go into uh, very often, it's like stays with you for your whole life, like Egyptian arts. Yeah, I remember the rooms in the Pushkin Museum. And when they um, asked me to help them with the sensory audit, then the answer was yes. And uh, I started to read into it. I spoke in a couple of conferences and I listened to people. Uh, and uh, suddenly it was something where my expertise as a neuroscientist and a uh, clinical professional um, and a hobby museum goer and uh, art history uh, geek uh, worked together. Uh, and uh, it was then also fueled by this feeling that it's really needed so that uh, like people, um, more people come to the museum and what's more important, they return to the museum because they feel welcome there. So this is, um, this, this has been very rewarding and um, I'm expanding it into other uh, clinical group, into other conditions, into other um, populations who need special uh, conditions or need, need some support. But uh, it was both professional and personal. Alexander. Yes, Irini. It's like, I mean, I'm always talking, but no one else is ready. So um, I was, I mean, I have children. Um, my older son has um, some sensory issues. And I remember that what was uh, most often the difficult thing was how people or, you know, as I grow older, I notice how people in a museum do not want 
um, really to face the fact that there are people who come in who have difficulties, or that's how I perceived it a lot. I think there is a lot of work that has been done in raising awareness uh, for autism and for you know other disabilities that um, we may encounter more people in museums now or um, in other spaces. I do remember once a theater director running after me outside the theater space when I had to leave because my son made noise at an inappropriate moment. And he was like chasing me out. It was like, how could you? And I was like, are you serious? I was like, you know, you make the effort, which as you described is really difficult. You're going, you're there with your kids or, you know, with adults uh, who have autism. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden you understand that, um, you know, people are staring at you very often, you know, and I've seen this also when, you know, I know I go with larger groups of people. And I think there is something to, like in the clip that you showed us from the UK, you know, they were, they were showing this, that people were actually looking at the kid and his mom, you know, and that's a very important issue that has nothing to do with the museologist, but um, I think as a society, you know, we need to raise awareness on the fact that, you know, we're not hiding, um, you know, our disabilities or our sensory issues or whatever, that, you know, we have equal rights as well to be everywhere. Um, we made such strong, um, you know, changes when it comes to physical disabilities, you know, with making every every possible place accessible or at least museums. But I remember uh, at the Venice Biennale, an artist who, um, you know, we have, we have to use these pavilions, right? That, and I was on a team working. We have to use those pavilions that are there, the historical buildings, you know, and there's not much you can do as with many uh, museums. And the artist had constructed this path for the visitors to experience her installation. Mm -hmm. And there was no way that this could be accessible the way she wanted it for somebody on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were like, well, you know, you have to change the direction because if it's made to go, let's say this way, but the ramp is this way, then the person who comes in with a wheelchair will experience your installation the wrong way and she wanted to hear nothing about it. And I was like, how is it possible that in our day and age, this person who's an educated, you know, artist cannot listen to us, you know? Um, so I think as a society, there's a lot to be done. Uh, I, mean, I think your work is amazing, obviously. Thank you. Irene, it's getting better. It's getting really better. So there were, there's more awareness now than there was 20 years ago. And um, well, it's on them. I, I, I really don't have much to tell you, but uh, if someone is staring or if someone makes some uh, remarks, uh, maybe they were not confronted with it uh, in, yeah. in a positive way. And so the next time it will be better. Uh, I, I can understand that it can be fantastically difficult for parents, for people with uh, different conditions, but um, that's why I was so glad to talk about you because I listened to you present all these wonderful projects last year, but now if there's just some of uh, people who plan for projects like this, they think about what happens if someone comes who has, who can't bear this loud noise. So do I have this alternative uh, for them to um, enjoy and to get the message still? Um, and museums, and I think it's a very positive thing. And it also originates in the United Kingdom actually, uh, that they said, uh, we want the profile of our visitors correspond to the profile of our demographics. So if there's some group that doesn't come to the museum, it's on us. Like 
I, I'm just fantasizing. If some ethnicity doesn't go to the, the cinema, so, well, okay, they may want to attract them because of uh, the profit loss. But uh, for museums, it's a, it's a matter of the professional integrity and uh, pride. So everyone should be welcome in the museum and museums can do good work there. In the United Kingdom, they found that, yeah, uh, visitors to art museums, they are whiter, they are wealthier, they are older, uh, and there are several more uh, points you can imagine. But for example, uh, young mothers with children they come to the museum no matter what their social status, no matter what uh, their race and ethnicity is and so on and so forth. So a couple of years ago, museums said, oh, we love families with strollers. And so it worked. The same should happen also with all other groups, including people who may have sensory difficulties. But it's not only work with other visitors, it's also work with uh, professionals who work in the museums because you know how many th times uh, I've heard, oh, how can we bring a group and not take them to these uh, rooms where we have huge Renaissance sculptures or plastic casts like with Michelangelo and so on? Uh, because that's what they come to see. Oh, no, they come to spend good time with their family or with their group and want to return back. So that's what we want to achieve. And we don't want to show them huge sculpture. And uh, once you have the professionals on your side, um, the visitors would do it too. But every 10th or then every 50th or every 100th will be a problem. And it's a professional risk we have to be aware of, but uh, we can't really do much about it. So go to the museums and go to all places with, I think we are all going to museums. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, sorry, there's one more thing, Carolina. Just one second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's one thing I did experience with my children a lot as a positive thing mm -hmm. is whenever there was a family room in the museums, and there are very few museums that have them that have actual spaces where you can sit down for a second and take a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also one of the strategies to have a, they used to call it sensory room, we don't call it sensory room anymore. Gracias por snack. Quiet room or uh, like a room where you can uh, take a break or come to the museum when it's not so crowded or many museums, yeah. they open up one hour earlier for, and uh, writing to the education department or writing to visit the experience is always a good start because sometimes they have provisions um, that are not very easy to find on the website or somewhere. Thank you. This was so informative. There was, it was just so much I didn't know. Um, I almost wish that when you get to a museum's landing page or website, there would be a, 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 an icon big enough for all to see, you know, like, you know, maps for right. those with sensory issues, you know, a logo, a, like, a, you know, a universal logo. Um, where everybody knows what it means, whether they're going to visit the Pushkin Museum in Moscow or coming from Moscow to the Metropolitan Museum. Everybody knows this universal symbol where they can click and get the maps of these safe areas. Um, but it doesn't appear that exists, correct? No, but maybe in the future. Yeah. Because we don't know about this sensory overload too much. So it's still a relatively new topic. It is one of the diagnostic criteria from what is only since 2012, when the DSM-5, like the uh, right. manual of psychiatrists and clinical psychologists are using, uh, was published. Before that, it wasn't even a diagnostic criterion for autism. So we don't have good instruments to measure it. We don't know much about why it's happening and what to do with it. But once it's more in the professional and public awareness, I um, think it's a fantastic idea so that people can find it quickly because I would be using it. Uh, sometimes I don't want to be overwhelmed and I don't have any sensory issues, not, not that I'm aware of, but um, especially if you are overwhelmed by contents, for example, you want the sensory part to be on the low side. Yeah, great idea. 
Thank you, Dr. Sorokin, for this wonderful talk. Uh, before we close, I just have a shout out for the Artivism team, Professor RG, Sarah Avery, Dr. Lake, and another shout out across the ocean over there, all the way to Ms. Nordaki, that is always with us. Um, what is it today? Seven hours difference? <laughs> well, it is midnight. It is midnight, so shout out to her and to our wonderful student ambassador today, Maria Shumarios, as well. Sorry for the loud noise in the background there. Um, would you leave us, uh, Dr. Sorokin, with three points, three takeaways from your presentation for the audience today for action? Oh, yeah. Be, please be aware that there are people who are different. Mm -hmm. So when you're planning your wonderful projects, um, there can be some bottlenecks. And once you're aware about them, try to do something. You can't change the world. But uh, if you do something, it will be appreciated. And the third thing, let's just be positive. So we are all together in this. And uh, the last thing I have to wish you all a fantastic academic year and uh, see you in the next Artivism uh, session again, because I enjoy them so much and learn so much from you. Well, thank you so much. Well, next week is Theater as a Tool for Social Change Fundraising. It's about giving circles with Alyssa Wright. Um, thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you so much, Maria. Good luck with medical school and your future. Hello to Irini and Tatsuya and all our friends, old and new. Um, thank you to Dean Lally, to Adelphi University for sponsoring us, along with Sync for Hope and Goddesman Libraries Teachers College at Columbia University. Uh, we could not be here if it wasn't for all of you. And for your support, Dr. Sorokin, for being with us every week. Um, and just keep us informed with your work. This was very inspiring. I'm sure we all learned a lot. And we should all be mindful, as you said, that we are all very different. We have issues of different kinds. And we need to have a mutual respect and be inclusive, include all people in whatever is available to most, museums and schools. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.